Sing praises to the Lord for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth.
my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But what I need, your word has said, is ever only Jesus. This weary heart finds all it needs in never only Jesus. I want to know you, Jesus, my Lord, King of the
to rise for my sleep at night. I depend on you. I depend on you. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. I'm the branch, and you. Thank you. You may be seated. Sorry.
I hope you've been blessed this weekend. I've been blessed any time we come to seek the Lord. It uh, never fails to be a glorious moment. And uh, I'm particularly excited for tonight. One of the things I look forward to the most in weekends like this, and I hope you would agree with me, is that I believe that there should be designated time for us to seek the face of God. Um, I stand before you today as a person who has been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I'm, not, I'm not here because uh, this is my career choice. I'm not here because uh, this is what I'm familiar with, so I'm comfortable uh, in this kind of realm and environment. The Lord bears witness that the only reason why I am here and in any other context like this is because at some point in my life, Christ became real. Christ interrupted my life, and I'm so glad that He did. And so at the age of 20, you can guess how old I am now, but at the age of 20, 13 years ago, I had my whole life planned. I had my career set out. I was two years into my creative advertising degree at Humber Lakeshore. I thought I had my marriage planned out. I thought I had my living space planned out. The next 20, 30 years set on a mental blueprint. And all of that changed in a month, the first month of 2012 when... Here's the thing. People say, well, why did you come to Christ at 20? You grew up in the church. Can I just see a show of hands of who here grew up in the church? That's probably 98% of us here. So I've been in meetings like this reluctantly. I've been in meetings like this with false motives. I've been in many conferences, youth settings, uh, Sunday services. I've heard many messages. I've heard a handful of gifted communicators. Notice I'm very specific in the way I'm displaying that. Gifted communicators. There's a difference between a gifted communicator and a spirit-empowered communicator of the gospel. So I've heard gospel invitations, I've responded to gospel invitations, I've even emotionally in times of crisis at a young age where there were some uh, problems within my own life or in people that I loved and I really wanted to see God come through, I, I have responded to some measure. But I also wondered why it took me up to the age of 20 to finally experience the John 3 new birth that Jesus Christ tells us about. And I think I figured it out. Down deep inside, when I was in meetings like this, and when I grew up in a Christian household, and when I heard about a life set apart for the Lord Jesus, and what it means to be saved, and escaping hell, and gaining eternal life, and having the assurance that your name is inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life. Down deep inside, though I wanted that, I really wanted other things. And so, no matter what was really presented to me, no matter how passionately it was given, no matter how deep the points were, no matter what kind of stories and testimonies were tacked on it, even in times of invitation where I would stand up or come forward or lift my hand or write my sins on a piece of paper so that they would throw it in the trash and promise all the youth group that they're going to burn it, I wanted something outside of Christ. I, would, I felt like maybe I, I've been too sheltered in and I kind of have enough exposure to the world to realize that it, it looks like they're having a good time. I think I'm missing out. So I tried to negotiate with the gospel unintentionally. I'll do what I can to uh, check off the list to make sure that I did the mental thing of securing my salvation with Christ, but boy, I can't wait to be liberated from a Christian upbringing and household and local church so I can sip a little bit from what I think I've been missing out on. So the 18 times, that's just a general number, the 18 times that I've responded to the gospel leading up to the age of 20, were not real responses because my heart was divided. Because all it took was a few days after a meeting like this for me to go out 
and to smell enough of the buffet of the world for me to be caught right back into a pursuit that does not define a true Christian. So what made it different at 20? I'll tell you what it was. I was sorely disappointed from the world. So when I had all license, when there were no restrictions, no supervision, living on my own, stuffed in a residence filled with other 18, 19 year olds that had no fear of God, what do you think is going to happen? Everything was at my disposal. And I tried it all. And only then, when everything failed me, did Christ's gospel become the most attractive that it's ever been. And so that made my response to the knowledge that I had growing up the real deal. Because I actually, I actually meant it this time. I actually had nothing else to turn to. It's either you save me from myself or I'm doomed. I'm finished. It could be that some of you here are familiar enough with the gospel where you think you're saved when you're actually not. How do you know you're saved? Because your mom told you? Because your dad told you? Because you have some credence? You made some verbal confession? James tells us there's a faith that can be 100% accurate theologically, and it's the same faith as demons. What's the difference between demonic faith and born-again faith? What that truth does to you. Demons don't obey God. Demons don't submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Demons can beat all of us at Bible trivia. But when you hear the gospel, what differentiates you is that you apply your heart to the truth that you just learned. And it transforms you. I, I'm, I'm so honored to be in, in a place like this and in places like this because I know how it feels for some, perhaps you, who are sitting in this place. And you've been hard as a rock the past 24, 48 hours. Like you're numb. You're, bo you're, you're actually waiting for me to finish. You can't wait for this to be over with so you can go on with what you really came here for. And if that's the truth, may I present to you an illustration of the danger of being in that place. Because by God's grace, He allowed me to live to the age of 20 and to realize that I was a fraud. And I gave my life truly to Christ. And I never looked back. It's been 12 years. I've never looked back. How do you know if you're born again? You ready for this deep theological thought? You know. Because the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Uh, can Satan cause you to doubt your salvation? Absolutely. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the one who isn't even concerned whether or not they're saved. I'm talking about the one who, um, whose confidence in their eternal life has no scriptural basis. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying all of this because I want to let you know where we're going tonight. I'm going to share a message for, for all people, including the believer. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get saved tonight. I, I can't do anything. All, all I can do is present the truth and present an opportunity for you to respond to that truth. And the genuineness of your experience is, the, is dependent upon your heart and it's between you and God. So my responsibility before God and before man is to be a faithful messenger. Your responsibility is to take that truth and do with it what you will. The unique thing as we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the unique thing about Jesus is that though He is a historical figure, He is a historical figure that cannot merely be studied. He cannot simply be preached about. He can't be discussed solely. Jesus Christ is such an important person that every time you hear about Him, especially the first time, it demands a response. And the response is one of two things. You either receive His Lordship or you reject it. 
Now, you might have never outright denied his lordship, but the indifference in itself is a denial. So when the gospel is presented, when you hear about Christ and what he's done for you, you might be bored, you, you might think, that, okay, this doesn't apply to me, but no matter what, objectively, it applies to every single human being, and all of us in this place will be judged based on what we did with the knowledge of Christ. I'm telling you that because you probably never heard that your whole life. I'm here to tell you there is an eternal heaven, there is an eternal hell. Your little life is but a vapor, according to the Bible, and your eternal life will begin the moment you give your final breath, and that's where it gets real. And what will determine your destination? One simple thing. What did you do with Jesus Christ? That's the only thing that's going to determine where you're going to spend the rest of your eternity. And the way I hope to persuade you by the power of the Holy Spirit is to speak to you about one thing concerning Christ. I want to talk to you about the incomparable love of Jesus. Notice, I didn't say the love of Jesus. I'm talking to you about the incomparable love of Jesus Christ. I stand here today to testify of Him. I bear witness to the Son of God because of His love. It's His love that causes you to turn away from sin. It's His love that causes you to surrender to Him joyfully. It's His love for you that helps you endure all the disappointing loves in your life. And one of the greatest manifestations of the love of Christ is found exclusively in one place in all of the Bible. And when you really grasp this love, it can actually rock your world. And it's intended to do just that. I say incomparable because there are many definitions of love. Some people and most people these days are increasingly believing that love means tolerance and acceptance of all things. But that can't be what true love is because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love rejoices with the truth. So all this talk about love, 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 love everybody, don't tell them to repent, don't tell them to turn from their sin and accept the Savior, that's not God's love. And some people have a fear of love. Because they've heard I love you's or people in their lives that were supposed to by nature love them have failed to love them. And they equate God's love with that kind of love. Love, according to the Bible, God's love at least, is not the same as infatuation. You and I are prone to loving in that way where we become excited about somebody or something. We're invested for a moment until something else draws our attention or wins us over and we abandon that thing that we pledged our allegiance to. That's not the love of God. But I think even among Christians who could amen everything that I just said up to this point concerning the love of Christ and the person of Christ and what it means to be truly born again, even genuine believers can sometimes doubt or question the love of Jesus Christ. Because they don't understand how His love operates. And that, that kind of thinking can go many ways. If God really loves me, then He will do this for me. He would do it in this way and He would do it at this time. And I want to show you that the incomparable love of Christ is interwoven with many other attributes of His concerning wisdom, power, glory, and so many other things. So turn with me to John 11, please. And let's consider the matchless love of Jesus Christ. Let's read the first four verses together. And that's going to be the majority of our time. I hope you still have energy for this sermon. Yeah, you guys showered and got changed. Good. You got some food in your system? Good, good. John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Let's consider a few things together. Notice that the Holy Spirit wants to make a distinction of the Mary that we're talking about in this testimony. There are many Marys in the Bible, but we're told that 
there was a certain man named Lazarus who was sick, and he was part of the village Bethany, where Mary and her sister Martha were. And verse 2 clarifies which Mary it is. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. This is more than the Bible trying to make a clarification of which Mary we're speaking about. It's also qualifying the kind of devotion she had to the Lord. This particular Mary did something to the Lord. You have to understand this. What she did for Christ in the final days of His time on earth was so significant that Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, what she has done will also be said in remembrance of her. The Lord has interacted with many people during His three-year tenure. Not one thing did He say coming close to that kind of homage. And you're familiar with the story. Most of you lifted up your hand when you say you grew up in the church. Surely you remember the story where this woman took an alabaster flask, broke it and poured it out on the head and feet of Jesus Christ. But let me remind you in the next chapter how that looked like according to John. John 12, verse 3. The same Mary, according to John 12, verse 3. Mary, this, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. You know how much this is worth? About a year's salary of a common worker. It was so expensive what this lady pulled out of her room and broke upon Christ that Judas made a remark that this was worth a certain amount, a, a, a significant amount that could have been used to feed some poor. But why did Mary do this? That's the most important question. Why did she go to this length to make this public display of adoration toward Christ at such a high cost? Jesus says to these disciples, she did this for what reason? She did this to honor me in my death. So Jesus acknowledges that Mary went to such lengths to anoint Him with oil because she had a revelation that most people didn't. Not even the twelve. How many times did Jesus tell the disciples that He was going to be betrayed, He was going to be tortured, He was going to be put to death, and He was going to rise from the dead? At least three times. And each time it went in one ear and out the other. They didn't get it. But Christ acknowledges that Mary did this in preparation for His burial. Do you know what tells me? that tells me about Mary? She listened to Jesus. Do you know where you find her in Luke chapter 10? When her sister Martha, typical Middle Eastern, running around trying to get the meal together, putting such emphasis on the food, where is Mary found? At the feet of Christ, eating His words. I am fully convinced that Mary of Bethany paid attention to what Jesus had to say. And though she didn't have the fullest understanding of what His sacrifice would do, she understood, He's going to die. He's going to die. And so I want to do what I can to honor Him in preparation for His death. Something that the disciples didn't get. In fact, they scorned her for it. And Christ defends her, says she's doing this for me. But here's what's even more significant. What chapter did she anoint the feet of Jesus in John? 12. 11 comes before 12. What a thought. What happens in John chapter 11? In the rest of this chapter, Lazarus, her brother, is actually going to die. He's actually going to be buried for a few days. And Christ is going to come intentionally late to raise him from the dead. And then John chapter 12 comes where this family holds a feast in his honor. Lazarus is at the table. And Mary pulls this ointment out and anoints the feet of Jesus. Think about it. She had the ointment to pour on Christ in preparation for his burial. Why didn't she anoint her brother? Why didn't she use the oil for Lazarus? Have you ever thought about that? Didn't she love Lazarus? I'm sure she loved Lazarus. She loved him enough to send for messengers for Christ to heal him. But she didn't give the ointment to anoint Lazarus. She gave it to Christ. She kept it for Christ. You know what that tells me? As much as Mary loved her brother Lazarus, she loved Jesus more. As much as she loved someone that you have a natural affinity towards, Christ's love in her heart dominated it. And this is the quality of worship that the Lord deserves. This is what He demands of us. 
that your supreme affection will be poured out on the Savior above everyone and anything else. But it even goes beyond that because the extent of her adoring allegiance were read there that she poured the ointment on him, but then she used something to dry his feet. What was it? Her hair. I'm sure she had some kind of towel to give. I'm sure she could have brought out some velvet type of handkerchief to bless royalty with, but instead she stoops down on the floor, pulls her hair to the side, and dries the feet of Christ with her hair. And it's not until you read later on in the New Testament of the significance of that. The Bible makes it clear that there are gender distinctions. I know that's controversial. And even physically, there are distinctions. And one of the distinctions that God makes concerning a woman and a man is that a woman has for her glory her what? That's found in 1 Corinthians 11.15. But if a woman has long hair, is it her glory? For her hair is given to her for a covering. So there's something about a woman concerning some of her features, and the future that's highlighted here is her hair. Her hair distinguishes her as a unique sex, and even in that distinguished, bestowed upon kind of feature, it glorifies God. So when you consider that commentary with Mary's action, what is she doing? Not only is she drying His feet, she's laying her glory at His feet. So in not preserving the oil for her brother and giving it to Christ, she's telling Jesus, you mean more to me than those who are closest to me. But in drying his feet with her hair, she's now saying, you mean more to me than me. Not only do you mean more to me than others, you have greater value than whatever I would take glory in. Whatever I would take comfort in. Whatever I would take pleasure in. Is it any wonder that Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, what she has done will also be told in remembrance of her. Because her response to the revelation of Christ dying for our sins is the response that Christ expects of all of us. That when you realize the extent of His sacrificial love, you would without hesitation say, Lord, you are a greater treasure than anybody else. And Lord, you deserve my devotion more than my desires. That sounds like supernatural, superstar kind of Christianity. I'm here to remind you that's ABC Christianity. Anything less than that is foreign to the New Testament. And so the Bible wants to show us her extravagant worship. For what reason in the context of her first few verses of John 11? Let's go back to it. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Do you see the connection? Not only are we to be reminded of who this Mary was and what she did for Christ, but it has a context. We're supposed to be told about her love and devotion to the Lord in relation to the experience that she's about to have. And the experience that she's enduring and that's only going to intensify is one of suffering. What's the point of that connection? Here's the point of that connection. That a woman of such caliber, a woman who loved the Lord to such a degree, was not exempt from pain was not exempt from experiencing turmoil, was not given some kind of shielding from any kind of flame or heat or difficulty or overwhelming clouds overshadowing her. This is to show you this Mary who stood out even from the twelve, this Mary that you would think would be untouchable from problems and tests of faith actually endured something extremely difficult. Let me remind you again how extravagant this was. John Penns, as you heard earlier, that when she poured this ointment on his feet, it filled the room with perfume. I love the human side of that. I, I, John was there, so John must have remembered what that perfume smelled like. 
In fact, I shared this point before, and, and a woman from our church met me after the service, and she actually had from Jerusalem the very same nard that Mary would have used. And she popped it open in our fellowship hall, and I smelt it. It smelt amazing. And the way Mary gave that was she didn't pop a, a little lid. She broke the neck of it. In essence, she gave everything with no intention of receiving a drop back. So no reservation for my worship towards you, Lord, my acknowledgement and my allegiance to you. And it filled the room with the perfume. Yes, that's a historical account, but there's a spiritual principle. When a person lives to that degree of kind of devotion to the Lord, it will rarely go unnoticed. When somebody is sold out to Christ to such a degree, they in essence carry a fragrance with them, do they not? But that doesn't mean that she would, she would not have to face something that, that is extremely difficult. And this is the connection. What's the problem? Her brother was sick. It wasn't a cold. It wasn't something that would be dealt with, with uh, physical, natural remedies. It looked bad. Every day is getting worse. His breathing is getting shorter. His pain is increasing. Maybe he's losing consciousness. Somebody call Jesus. And so she makes the effort with her sister as his brother, as her brother is declining at a concerning rate, to have Christ come. And the first thing that we notice in sending this messenger, these messengers to Christ, in verse 3, is very telling. So the sister sent him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. What's the first word there? Lord. He's still Lord. My brother is ill, but you're still Lord. My brother is dying, but you're still Lord. We're doing everything that we can, and everything that we can do is failing, but you're still Lord. I feel for Mary and Martha. Can I tell you why? Because I am much more willing to suffer than see somebody I love suffer. Any day. Any day. I don't care how severe the disease is. Put it on me. Let it shrivel up my body and my bones. I'd rather take it upon myself than look at a loved one and feel as though I can't do anything to change it. So my heart goes out to these sisters. They sent word to Christ and they say, Lord, you're still Lord. And this was a term of honor, of course, but it goes beyond that. They're standing there with this rising flood but they could still also, as the water is coming closer and closer to their neck, crown Jesus with His rightful place. Despite all that this happening, you are still the captain, you are still my leader, you are still my king. But look at the request. It's so short. It's so brief. But it's packed with powerful truth. Lord, He whom you love is ill. Notice that they didn't mention their brother's name. Lord Lazarus is ill. They didn't say that. They just said, Lord, he whom you love is ill. With absolute confidence that Christ would know exactly who they were speaking about. The ambiguity there is intentional. They had such confidence in the love of Christ for Lazarus that they didn't even need to mention Lazarus' name. You know what that tells me? That tells me that Lazarus' identity was wrapped up in the love of God. You could not separate Lazarus' identity from God's genuine, warm compassion and love for him. And so they didn't even see it necessary to say anything about who it is that was sick. That was sick. And they could have said, Lord Lazarus is, but they were absolutely assured that Christ had a place on his heart for Lazarus. You know, one of the pictures of Christ in the Old Testament, there are many that are overlooked. The high priest would have a breastplate the size of a hand, a hand breath. And on it were the, the 12 tribes of Israel separately as different stones. 
And it's a picture of Christ who as our high priest carries our names on his heart as he intercedes before us. When we sing a lot of songs... Can I tell you one thing that Jesus Christ is doing right now while you're sitting here, while you're playing in the gym, while you're walking around this beautiful city? We're told that He is interceding for us. That's what The Lord didn't finish His ministry. He finished His ministry on earth. But right now, Christ is standing as our eternal high priest, making everlasting intercession for each of those who belong to Him. You're saying, why is that important? Because there is a Satan who is so prideful and persuasive that he has the gall and the audacity to try to convince the Father to change his mind about you and to cast you into an eternal hell. God, this is your son and he's watching pornography for the seventh week in a row. This is, this is your child, huh? Oh, this is your daughter and she's cheating on her husband. Is that, that's what your blood does? Look at these guys. These guys are running. They can't even pay attention in a one and a half hour session. They love Instagram more than they love you. These belong to you? And if you think that sounds nasty, I'm sure the enemy of our souls is much more creative and specific with his venomous slander and accusations. And while that's happening... Your high priest says, Father, look at my wounds. I died for him. Father, look at my pierced side. Look at my feet. I died for her. And every single time the Father says, I accept your sacrifice. I see them through your wounds. That's what Christ does. Yeah, while you're fumbling and while you're distracted, the Son of God intercedes for you if you truly belong to Him. And if that truth encourages you to continue to sin, you might have to reconsider your salvation. But if you're a person who hears that and says, Oh Lord, may it never be of me that I dishonor this love. That's a good sign. Lazarus' identity was woven and wrapped in the love of Christ. And notice again that they did not say, Lord, look again, there's something else here. They said, Lord, He whom you love is ill. You know what they didn't say? Lord, he who loves you is ill. They could have said that. Did Lazarus love Christ? He adored Christ. But they didn't say that. They didn't say, Christ, the one who loves you, the one who serves you, the one who honors you, the one who is willing to testify of you, though there's hostile religious leaders around Bethany because we live very close to Jerusalem. No, no, they didn't base their confidence of Christ answering their prayers on their love for Him, but on His love for them. Big difference. So where they can draw their hope is that Christ loves them. Christ loves Lazarus. That's where they were drawing the promise from. I'm telling you, This is why I'm speaking about the love of Christ, because it's so much stronger than you imagine. We often stand in the place of trying to persuade Christ to do something with our performance. Lord, I've been loving you for years. Uh, I've been loving you for these past months, especially. I've been doing really good. And when our performance is poorer, we're less stronger in our attempt to try to fellowship and ask Christ for anything. And yet we have a model here of these sisters who knew Christ and they knew very well of His love, so much so that they didn't even consider what they had to offer Him. They were fully persuaded that He had so much to offer in Himself. Lord, He whom you love is ill. You'd be amazed to know how many people question if Christ loves them. Like some days you believe He loves you and other days you think that He's reconsidering you. That's not how these sisters thought. I I want the faith of these sisters who were so convinced that their brother was loved, that God would act on his behalf, 
And I wonder if we believe that for ourselves and for others. But it, that's not the only thing about this verse that moves me. So the sister sent them saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So they call him Lord. They say, he whom you love is ill. Lazarus' identity isn't mentioned there. They didn't go on the basis of Lazarus' love for Christ, but Christ's love for Lazarus. But notice here that they're not making any request. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Here's how I would do it if my brother was sick. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Get here as soon as you can. It's looking really bad. Lord, he whom you love is ill. We believe in the authority of your word. Just say it, and he will be restored. No request is made. Just the need. Just the news. Just the report. And I don't believe that this is suggesting that you and I should be unspecific with our request. The Bible would encourage otherwise. But I am persuaded that there are times in which the turmoil is so turbulent... The tide is so strong. The situation is so complex and confusing and emotionally demanding that you don't even know how to pray for it. And the model here more than anything else is you can come to Christ fumbling, confused, foggy, and He knows exactly how to translate what you are asking, what you are saying. I'll never forget the time where this was made so real to me, where a dear sister in Christ who's much older, lives in a different place altogether, not part of our church, calls me with terrible news. Terrible news. Man. I can't tell you details, but it's bad. It was so bad that she was stuck in the middle that no matter what decisions she made, people close to her would pretty much turn on her for good. Not that she was in the wrong but because she was associated with somebody who did something atrocious. She had to make a choice. And there were two sides waiting for her to make that choice. And here she is calling another for some help. And she said something that shot a verse to my mind and I shared with her and I never had applied this verse. I always knew about this verse, but I never applied this verse until that very moment because it became real. I'm telling you, you need to know the Bible. This is what I'm trying to get at. The scriptures can speak to you in surprising ways. She says this, Brother, this is so overwhelming. I don't even know how to pray about it. What do I ask God to do? To go this way? To go that way? To go no way? What do I ask to do? And this is the verse that came to mind and I read it to you from Romans 8.26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You know what that verse means? Here, here's what that verse means. That there are times where you don't know even how to pray. And one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to us, being our inheritance, our seal, our everlasting companion on this earth, is that in those moments where you can't, you can't even formulate the sentences, your prayer has been reduced to a sigh. We're promised here by Paul that the Spirit takes that groaning, that sigh, and He brings it before the Father, and He says, Father, this is what they need. Father, this is what they're asking for. With perfect accuracy. Exactly the way you would need it. The Spirit Himself intercedes for us. That's what it means. And that's what I told her. I said, you just crawl on your face if you need to and lay there for however long you need to lay there and repeat, help me, help me, help me. And the Holy Spirit promises to take those words and intercede them perfectly before the throne of grace. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Full stop. And they had the absolute assurance that Christ would know exactly what to do. For the first time in this chapter, Jesus speaks in verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, He said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. 
so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Moreover, we see here that Lazarus' sickness and temporary death was making a way for the Son of God to be exalted. And what I love about this here is that Christ clearly perceives something that these sisters could not see in this situation. So the sisters here, in the natural mind, this is sickness, this is death, it offers nothing more than agony, it offers nothing more but loss, it offers nothing more than pain, but Christ is looking at the same picture, and you know what He sees? Glory. Glory. He sees wisdom. He sees gain. He sees fruit beyond what they could imagine. And Jesus does this in other places, does He not? With a man born blind, the disciples ask Him, who sinned, His parents or Him? There's no way He can have this condition. They had the same theology as Job's friends. Here's Job sitting there suffering, and his friends come around him and says, Okay, Job, cough it up. You did something, man. You can't lose your family and your house and your business and your own health without God being displeased about something. So why don't you just cough it up? What did you do, huh? Did you cheat people? Did you look at a woman lustfully? Do you have pride? You have pride, Job. That's what the whole thing is about. And Job says, you know what? You guys are actually miserable counselors. Actually, you guys were better when you were quiet the first seven days than when you're spewing out all this garbage. So the disciples developed the same theology. Here's this man born blind. Uh, so how did it happen, Lord? And you know this very well. Jesus said, it was not because this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So we see here Christ, those who would narrowly interpret such trials as being without purpose, being completely in vain, he sees redemption. And so this is why you need to understand who Christ is. And the closer you get to them, the more you see as he sees. And now he makes this statement, and we're just, like, if you're reading this for the first time, you're like, okay, what's going to happen now? This is a cliffhanger. And naturally, you would think, now we're going to see the movement. But there's this interesting verse that seems to cause us to pause and wonder, what's the purpose of it? It's verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, rather, and her sister, and Lazarus. That's the verse. Now Jesus, by the way, I love this, how you highlight one verse and everything else goes. What's that verse doing there? Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. We know that he loved Lazarus. We were told that he whom you love is ill, but the Holy Spirit wants us to pause and consider the fact that he loved all of them. He didn't just love the brother. He loved the sisters. And what's so amazing here is that Christ in this story wants to teach us that His love spreads to all of us. Whether you are the object of suffering or not. And what's so amazing about this mention of Christ's love is that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, though they were siblings, they were so different from one another. Even with the limit, limited information that you get about them, they differed. So you see Martha, right, in Luke chapter 10. And what does Martha do? She's running around anxious. She's trying to serve Christ. And her problem wasn't serving, by the way. It's the fact that she was serving with such angst and she was now criticizing those she shouldn't have criticized. So Martha is a picture of a servant. Like that's how she showed her love for Christ. Because even in this dinner where Jesus is anointed, you see that she is actually serving Him. And Christ doesn't say anything to her. So, so Martha is the picture of a servant. She, that's her strength. Mary, listen, if you study Mary, every time Mary is mentioned in the Gospels, every time she's mentioned, you find her at the feet of Jesus. So in Luke 10, while her sister is running around, she's at the feet of Jesus. In John 11, when Jesus finally arrives to Bethany, Mary hears the news, she comes to Jesus, and we read here in John 11, she falls at His feet. And in John chapter 12, she anoints Jesus' feet, and what is she doing? She's right there, drying His feet with her hair. Every time you see Mary in the Gospels, she's at the lowest place 
in the presence of Christ. So Martha is the picture of the servant. Mary is the picture of the worshiper. What about Lazarus? Lazarus doesn't say anything. You have no recorded word of Lazarus. But it's interesting, you read in the Gospels that after Lazarus was raised from the dead, he's sitting, reclining with Jesus at the table, and people came to the dinner party because they heard that Lazarus. They didn't just come for Jesus. We're told that they came also for Lazarus, for Christ raised him from the dead. And this so infuriated the Pharisees because people were coming to Christ because of Lazarus' testimony. And what I love about Lazarus is that Lazarus never shared a thing. No recorded words and people were still coming to Christ. Lazarus is a picture of the silent witness whose life was so transformed by the resurrection power of Jesus, that yes, though physically people said, you're dead but you're alive, but it's also a picture of you spiritually, you're different. I'm not a fan of that quote that says, preach the gospel and when necessary use words. Have you heard that quote? I know it looks nice on a coffee mug, but it's not good. You need to use words to preach the gospel. But I understand the sentiment of it. There should be a level of transformation like Lazarus where people can look at you and say, what? Something happened to you. Something happened to you. I'll never forget in college. My first year of college was outside of Christ and a few months into the, my second year of college, I was a different person. And I had to do some cleaning up. Because I had people come up to me and say things to me, things that I might have appreciated when I was not saved but things that I don't want associated with my name now that I am saved. And so I assure that when I walk into class and people will be like, hey, da 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 I'm like, no, no, no. Let me sit with you and tell you what Christ has done for me. And I'll never forget one day I'm leaving class and every time I had to leave class, I had to leave the main entrance to get to my apartment. And in the main entrance there was a gym and there was the office that had a door where you have to beep your card so you can go to the back. And one day I'm crossing with my backpack and here's a guy and he goes, Oh, yo, yo, Daniel. And he came through the door and met me in the hallway and he goes, Listen, man, I got to talk to you. And I hadn't seen this guy really much since my first year. He goes, Listen, man, I got to talk to you. I said, Okay, what's up? He goes, Look, he's like, I heard about you. I heard that you're some like magic prayer guy. I don't know what that means, but I think I got the idea. Kind of. Okay, what do you have to ask? And he began to pour out his heart, got himself in some deep trouble and sin. I said, look, I'm, I'm going to a dinner that our church holds for college students. They offer free dinner. You want to come with me? Let's talk about it. He goes, yeah. He signs out of work and he follows me through. But I thought to myself, Lord, I want that for the rest of my life. Even though people might not be able to know what to make of it, I want people to be able to say, I heard that you're the magic prayer guy. Lazarus was the silent witness. He had a testimony that caused people to just observe and be attracted to what Christ could do. But more than anything about verse 5 is how it connects to verse 6. And before you go to verse 6, can I say something else? Jesus could love Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. They were different in personality. They were different in strengths. They were different in weaknesses. If Jesus can love these colorful, different individuals, can't you and I? You walk in the church long enough, you serve Christ long enough, and guess what? You're going to get some different people walking across your path. You're going to get different people becoming members in your church. And I know predominantly here we're all Middle, Middle Eastern, and that's okay. But even among Middle Easterns, you have people who have mixed up personalities, right? You become Christian long enough, you're going to have to do this thing with other believers. And from time to time, they might step on your toes. From time to time, as your church might grow, you're going to have some people come in, and they're not going to get your culture. Are we here to reach uh, one culture, or are we here to reach the nations? We're here to reach the nations. And over time, you might even have some people get it, and guess what? They don't understand your humor. 
the church you grew up with for years, you have inside jokes and you get it and you have all these comfortable ideas and notions and memories and here comes somebody new and they don't get it and when you try to get them on it, they don't get it either and you don't understand it and it's confusing and it's awkward and it's like... So be careful because Christ loves everybody individually despite their differences. Ask Christ for that same kind of love for others. I've been in ministry for, let's say, how long here? Coming up to 10 years. Full-time ministry. Here's what I determined. Lord, whoever you put in front of me, whoever comes through those doors, whoever leaves or comes, help me by your grace to love them and serve them with everything in my heart. If they're here for five minutes, five days, five weeks, five months, five years, 50 years. If they're loyal, disloyal, if they're here to add or take, help me please to love them whether they're Mary, Martha, or Lazarus, whether they're awkward or they're very personable, whether they get my culture or they don't get my culture, I want to be able to love the way you love. But this is the main point. Those are side points. The main point is verse 6. It's one word in verse 6. In verse 5, we're told that he loved each of them. You see that word right there? It's two letters. So. That's a very important word. Because it connects the preceding verse with the following verse. And here's what we're told in verse 6. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Again, here's Daniel Batar say, if I was in this situation, let's say I was one of the disciples. Here I am standing there, and two messengers come, and they say, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And everybody catches it. It's Lazarus. Lazarus is sick. It must, be, it must be serious. And talking with the other disciples, and now we're awaiting Christ's response to this, to this news. Time is of the essence. And John commentates later on as a record. He loved, he loved each of them. And he's preparing us for verse 6, by the way. Because if he didn't have verse 5, you would question his love, perhaps, for this family. So here, I'm one of the disciples. I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you going to do? I'm probably even ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm making my way into our hotel and I'm getting the bags ready because we're making our way to Bethany. And the Lord hears this news. And what does He do? We're not told. But with a sanctified imagination, perhaps He acknowledged the messengers, nodded His head, turned to the disciples and He says, let's get dinner ready. Maybe, maybe he wants us to eat so we can have more strength for the journey. Okay, go, get, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'll get it ready over here. And they have dinner. And the Lord finishes his plate and he looks up to his disciples and says, Could you please get my bed ready? Did you hear that, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, let's just do it. Maybe he's very tired. We would have to stop on the way. He wants to do it fresh in the morning. Lord will get the bed ready, and they get the bed ready. And he wakes up. And perhaps the disciples are up even before him. They know what's coming. Peter, James, John, can you please get breakfast ready for us? I'm going to pray for some time, and I'll come back. Are you guys catching this? And then lunch, and dinner again, sleep. And then they wake up. After two days, then they went. I wonder if the disciples said, Lord, did you hear what those messengers said? I wonder if that ever came up. You know how you and I equate love? Well, imagine in your situation. Here you get a phone call. Your father, your mother, terrible news. Your siblings, your friend. What does love look like? The moment you hang up that phone, you drop all your plans, you cancel those plans, and you make your way to be at their side. Yeah, in many cases, that's what love looks like. But can I remind you, Jesus' love is incomparable. And if you're not careful, then you can look at a text like this and you can misapply it. And this is why this kind of story is given to us, because if not, you may fail to console your heart with this, that when the Lord Jesus does not deliver in the way we imagine or desire, it is in no way an indication that His love for me is diminished or lacking. You know what I realized in preparing for this, for this evening? That there's a consistent thread in every message. 
They didn't plan for that. But this, this idea that keeps coming up of unmet expectations, disappointment, failing to interpret how providence works in your life. So, I, I may not understand the ways of the Lord. I may not comprehend in my trying moment how He is working, but there is one thing I can be absolutely confident of. Whether He does come in the timing that I think He should or He is delayed. Verse 5, He loves. He loves the one who is close to the suffering. He loves the one who is suffering. He loves everyone associated with this whole thing. He loves. That's the thing that's going to anchor you. And the temptation that we are constantly to resist is that we measure the love of God. We testify of the love of God based on the swiftness of His provision. Or the quickness of His intervention. And though He can demonstrate His love in such a way, sometimes in His love, He waits. How can this be? Because in His infinite wisdom, this is where we should perk up and pay attention because we're landing this thing very soon. In His infinite wisdom, like this testimony before us, delay is going to be the means to build a greater testimony and bring greater glory. It can only come through delay. It can only come if He waited two days longer and Lazarus gave up his breath and was buried. Only then could Christ have the platform to create a greater testimony for the good of those who would know of it and greater glory unto Himself. We limit God's glory with the magnificent, with the spectacular, with the spontaneous, with again the swiftness. Have you ever considered that God takes delay into consideration when He wants to be glorified in your life? One of my favorite examples of this is in an obscure miracle. It shouldn't be obscure. It's one, one of the most known miracles in the book of Acts. And here's where we're ending after this. There was a man who was crippled for decades of his life and he was placed daily at the gate called Beautiful. One day, Peter and John are making their way towards temp the temple, the time of prayer. And as they arrive there, this man who had the, the custom of begging for, for some kind of monetary donation is surprised because these two now look at him and they said, silver and gold we have not, but what we do have we give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he springs up. He catches the attention of the masses. They enter into the temple and revival comes. And we love that story. It's a, it's a wonderful story, but again, when you have the wider scope of Scripture in view, you begin to ask some questions. Can I present to you a possible and worthy question in light of this story? Assuming that this man was placed at the gate called Beautiful, which is connected to the temple, assuming that he's been there for quite some time, have you ever wondered why Jesus did not heal him? Jesus went to the temple often. Jesus taught in the temple at one point daily. What's the likelihood that he was aware or even passed by this very man at the gate called Beautiful? Let's just hypothetically think about it here. If that was so, why didn't Christ ever take the opportunity to heal this man and to only further confirm that he is the Messiah? The omniscient one surely knew of it, and if it produced such fruit through Peter and John, what could it have done for Christ's testimony if He took advantage of it Himself? He doesn't. He doesn't. And I wonder if it was strategic. Saying, why wouldn't He have? I have a hunch. I have a hunch that in allowing this miracle to take place through the hands and through the ministry of Peter and John, it would fulfill a greater purpose that would be necessary at that specific time. Jesus had done many miracles throughout His life that confirmed that He was the prophesied Messiah. But Jesus also needed to confirm another vital truth concerning Himself. And it would be confirmed in one way through that miracle. Because Peter confesses to that. You're saying, what are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. 
Peter and John provide this healing, yes, through the authority of Christ, and this is what they confess. Here are these words from Acts 3.16. Peter says, And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Do you see what Peter is pressing here? This man was healed not by our own piety or righteousness, but by faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Implying what? When you apply your faith to Jesus, things happen. Why is that significant? Because the recent news in Jerusalem is that this same Jesus of Nazareth was nailed to a cross and buried in a rich man's tomb. So what does this miracle prove? That same Jesus, faith in His name, He's alive. He's alive. That's what this miracle proved. That's what this miracle testified. So let's put the whole thing together. Could it be that Christ didn't heal this man at the gate called Beautiful? Because there would be a time where it would be necessary for Peter and John to perform it. To what? Not testify of His Messiahship necessarily, but of His resurrection and ascension. What would it need for Christ to perform something to show the Jews in that time that Jesus ascended on high and lives and if you apply faith in His name, He actually answers, delay. Delay. That man to remain at that gate for a few more months or maybe even years. And at the right time, those legs would be healed, He would get up, there would be a greater testimony and greater glory for God. Factor in delay for God's glory in your life. We want, oh, oh, no, no. You, do you love me? to do it now. Do you want? I'm praying now. I want to glorify you, Lord. Do it now. Stretch it, broaden it, deepen it, expand it. What if God doesn't want to be glorified in that way? Who's this about anyway? Is it God's glory or your mind? If it's all about God anyway, let Him take care of it. Yeah, be desperate, be hungry, ask, plead, believe, work. But be open to delay being the necessary ingredient in that recipe for a greater testimony and greater glory. I love hymns. For many reasons. One of the reasons is when you study some of the stories behind these hymns, it makes the hymn even more powerful. There's the, the richness and the deepness of hymns, like lyrical genius that will cause your heart to soar in adoration when you see those, those, those verses brought together with such beauty and melody that they stand the test of time, many of them. And not all hymns are good. Some of them are bad. Uh, my wife, uh, Joelle, introduced me to one of these hymns a, a few months ago and it resurfaced this past week and I haven't been able to get it out of my head. She, she's been hearing it in our room because I keep playing it on the laptop. And the reason why I'm so hooked is because I love to look behind the story concerning some of these songs. And when they touch you, they just touch you. And this is one of them. I shared it with a few of you already. Oh, love that will not let me go. The man who wrote that hymn in the 1800s was named George Matheson. He was a Scotsman. He was a Scottish preacher. But he suffered. He suffered from an ailment with his eyes. He had a condition that promised him permanent blindness eventually. And some aren't sure about this part of his testimony, but most actually believe that this was the case. He was engaged at a young age to a woman. And when he learned of this disease, he obviously informed her about it and she broke off the engagement because she couldn't imagine living the rest of her life with a blind man. The condition was worsening. He was a genius himself. He was a scholar. He studied theology. And one of his sisters, among the different siblings that he had, uh, took it upon herself to take care of her ever-growing ill blind brother. You know how much she wanted to support him in his study and pursuit of theology? She herself learned Greek, Hebrew, and Latin to help him study. 
For years, she was by his side. The disease is getting worse. It came to a point where he reached blindness, but God's grace in his life was so wonderful that he was able to pastor a church of 1,500 to 2,000 people. A blind preacher. Some say that this man was so brilliant, so in tune with the things of God, that he could have led the church in Scotland of his day. One day, the same sister who took care of him for all those years fell in love. She was going to get married. And that would obviously necessitate for her to live with her husband and move out of the home that she had shared with her brother. On the eve of the the wedding, the whole family got together, but the preacher stayed back while the family went ahead in celebration to prepare for the wedding the next day. And it was on that night that he wrote this hymn. And he testifies that this hymn was birthed out of extreme mental and spiritual anguish. And yet he also testified that there was something, something strange about how this hymn came to him. He says, it's as though it was dictated to me. And he's saying that it, it came at such extreme rapidity Some believe that he wrote it within five minutes and he himself says that it required no additional editorial work. And he realized on that eve, my sister now is going to leave me. What am I going to do alone as a blind man? And even the fact that she would leave him for a man that theme of love reminded him of his younger years when a woman wouldn't love him because of his same ailment. So this is what he penned. There's four verses. I'm just going to read two of them for you. O oh love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean's depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O joy that seekest me through the pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I see and trace the rainbow in the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. O love that will not let me go. He's been let go by others. But what soothed his heart, though blind physically, his eyes inwardly were open to a love that would not let him go. This is the love of Christ. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to this love. If you've never experienced the love of Jesus Christ to save your soul, you can begin a journey now that you were intended to walk. Man has sinned against God. It has created a separation between a holy being and a creation that he longed to fellowship with but because of their free agency, chose to turn their back on this God and make their way towards self-worship. And God in heaven with His great love, though in His holiness had every right to restart the whole thing, bundle us all up and throw us into an eternal abyss, chose instead to allow this rebellious race to continue on And we're told in Galatians chapter 4, 4, that at the perfect time, God sent forth His Son, born under the law, born among women, that He might save us. You see, Jesus Christ entering into this world is the greatest expression of God's love for you and I. You see, every single one of you here are going to exit this world. But as one preacher said, before you exit this world, would you consider the one who entered into this world? Christ enters into this world and He lives a perfect, sinless life. 
and he was nailed to a tree, not because he was arrested outside of his control, but he says, I lay down my life and I have the authority to take it up again. Some of the enemies of the gospel would say, how can you believe Jesus is God? He was overtaken by a few mere men and was nailed on a tree. That's your example of God? No, 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 you don't understand. Christ gave his life. It wasn't taken from him. He lays his life down. He goes upon that tree. And men had different ideas of why he was suspended between heaven and earth. But the Bible tells us that he drank every drop of the wrath of God. From the sin of our first parents to the sins of the last people who would exist on the earth, past, present, and future, Christ absorbed every single thing that deserves the justice of God. And the crucifixion of that time was so gruesome. But what was the most painful for Jesus Christ was in some mysterious way that we must be careful to tread is that the clouds came supernaturally. There was some kind of eclipse that did not make sense. And there was this period of darkness that symbolized the Father seeing the sin of the world cloaking the Eternal One and turning His face away. And Christ, though limited with His breath, though collapsing in His lungs, exclaimed with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because for the first time in all of eternity, and again, a way that I am being very careful because I must not try to explain the inexplainable. There was a pain of a fellowship that's never been fractured. And no, it wasn't fractured, but there was something about it that needed to happen. So that, yes, though the Father did hide Himself from the Son, it's so that He can shine His face toward you. And though Jesus hanging on that cross, the one who said, come to me if you would drink living water, now His lips are dry. Why? So that you would never thirst again. And you had the crown of thorns on His head. Why? So that every dirty, filthy, perverted thought that if it were to be projected for 60 seconds on the screen would cause you to run out of this room, get in your car and drive back home, never to show your face again. He bled for those sins. And everywhere where your hands have gone, the people you shouldn't have touched, the websites you shouldn't have visited, the money that wasn't yours that you took, the people that you've hurt, the gestures that you've made, He died for those sins. And what your heart has longed for, and all the filthy passions, and all the meditations, and all the lust, and all the inward adultery, and evil, and covetousness, His side was pierced to cleanse your heart. And where your feet have gone, where they shouldn't have gone. The company that you've walked with, that you shouldn't have walked with. The authority that you rebelled against and turned your back on. Everything where your feet have done and where they have gone, He considered and they were nailed to that tree. From head to toe, what Jesus Christ did on the cross can cover you and cleanse you totally. It baffles me, man. It absolutely baffles me that there are people who are willing to reject the good news. It's a gift. He extends it to you, says, this is what I did for you. And what I'm asking of you is that you would acknowledge that you have sinned, that you need my saving work, and you will leave a transformed soul. So my question number one is this, have you made that decision? I'm not asking if you grew up on a pew. I'm not concerned about that. Now, I, I, know, I know you went to Sunday, you teach Sunday school, wonderful. There are people who can teach Sunday school and be surprised at the judgment day. I'm asking you if, based on what you just heard, you've made a conscious decision to say, if that is what God did for me, and in response He demands my repentance and my faith, I will repent and I will believe. Did you do that? Did you? Okay, why won't you? Do it today. There's nothing else He can do to prove His love to you. 
And I beg you, I admonish you, I exhort you, cancel everything around you, make this moment a holy moment, and seek God and leave here with the confidence that He's changed your heart. And now the foundation of your confidence for tomorrow and the reason why you live today is upon that truth. He died for me, so I live for Him. There are too many confused, deceived churchgoers these days. I can't afford to be light with this on this final evening. I am under the persuasion and woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. So have you made that decision? Uh, no, 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 no. Did you make that decision? Make it today. Make it today. Don't question it. Why are you gambling with it? Why are you playing with your soul? Why are you thinking that tomorrow's promise? I've met enough people who thought that they had strength. They took the creatine. They took the vitamins. They go to the gym. One car accident. Bye-bye. So don't think that you're invincible. Make right with Christ today. He expressed His love towards you. Are you going to show your love towards Him? Number two, my dear believer who has responded to that gospel, praise be to Him that you have responded. I want to give you the opportunity today to be like Mary and Martha. Unburden your soul today. Meet with God today. Maybe you've been so busy and there's been so much going on. Maybe you have not responded to the trial or the delay as you should. Here's your opportunity now to come before the Lord and say, Lord, 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 you're still Lord. And present your problem, put it before Him. Maybe you have to say, he whom you love is ill. She whom you love is ill. I'm ill. Just talk to the Lord. Ask Him to make His love real to you. Ask Him to have the confidence of His love for you like these sisters did. Meet with Him. He's the living Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Risen from the dead. We're going to close this meeting in a minute here. Please bow your heads. I don't usually do this, but the only reason why I'm going to do this is because I genuinely want to pray. And actually, it's on my heart to pray for people today. But I want to pray for anybody here who has not accepted Christ as Lord. Just even in the silence right now, just respond to the things that you heard. I'm going to pray, but it's not going to signify the end of the meeting. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give us time to, res to respond. And if the praise team can join us as they help us to seek the Lord, please. Unless you have to do business with God, that's fine. But whenever you're ready, please join me on the platform. Lord, we look to you tonight. We thank you for the incomparable love of Christ. It was preached, it was heard, but Lord, only you can make it experiential. Oh God, be glorified in manifesting the love. A love that will not let me go. Lord, tonight I pray that people would rest their weary souls in thee and give thee back the life they owe. For those who are in pain, may they experience that joy that seekest me through the pain. And help us today, through your truth, trace the rainbow through the rain. And know that it is not in vain, that promise that there is a morning come, coming where we will be tearless. Help us tonight, Lord. We need you to make this happen by the Spirit, not in the flesh. So protect us from the flesh. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As they play, whatever they do, if you're a person in here that knows the Lord, I encourage you, take this time. If you need to get to the front, bend your knee, bend your knee. If you want to pray with somebody, pray with somebody. If you're a person here who has heard the gospel and you're ready to receive Christ, I'm standing in the back corner right there. I ask you to stand up, meet me in the back. Even if you're not sure of your salvation, for the first time you've been made aware that you have left off this truth of the gospel, you became so familiar with it, you became casual with it, now it's dawned on you, this is my eternal soul, I need to know if I'm right with God, I will stay there as long as I need to stay there. But I'm going to be standing there while the other people here are worshiping the Lord, and let's, let's assure that you have your heart right with God. I'm going to be waiting there, you're going to be standing there, I'm going to be standing there, meet me there, don't delay, and let's do this together. Give me the privilege of helping you come to know Christ. Please play for us whenever you're ready. Please worship us. And we're going to be over there. Whoever comes, even if it's one, if it's 20, I don't care. And let's see God do mighty things tonight in Jesus' name. God bless you. Let's sing, Lord, I need you, together.